Hello and welcome once again to the third of five lectures uh, by Angelica Baena. I welcome you on behalf of Javier Calderón, the rector of the UK Mexican Art Society. And my name is Ana Elena Gonzalez Treviño from the Center for Mexican Studies, UNAM UK. It is my pleasure to introduce Angelica Baena once again to this fascinating series of talks um, about Mesoamerican art. Um, Dr. Angelica Baena received her PhD in Mesoamerican Studies from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, and she specialized in Mesoamerican iconography. She lectured at the Faculty of Higher Studies Acatlán, FESACATLAN, uh, UNAM, for six years. She has published several articles regarding pre-Hispanic codices and the Mexica religion. She has published articles in academic journals and books and uh, taken part as a speaker in several international academic meetings in Mexico, Peru, Argentina, Spain, England, and Poland. And today we have the great pleasure of listening to her tell us about um, an introduction to Mesoamerican iconography. Welcome, Angelica. I'm really looking forward to, to this topic. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, to joining us today. Um, today, I will talk about one of my greatest passions, that is the iconography. But particularly, I will explain how this um, academic study works, how we can um, approach the images in Mesoamerica, and I will base my examples in a group of codi codices or codex called uh, divinatory or called uh, Borgia group. These uh, documents are uh, very important because let us know about the beliefs of uh, the Mesoamerican people, particularly in the post-classic period and in central Mexico. So first of all, the question will be, what is iconography? So in order to understand the images, it has, been, it has been different approaches to know how to decodify what we can see. So originally, this group of codex were approached by, by a German um, researcher uh, who gave us the tools, the basic tools to understand that uh, images. His approach was, um, he, he's the person that I'm talking about, he, his name was Edward Seller. And his approach was based on trying to make comparisons with this, uh, the images that appear in these documents with the codex that were created in the colonial period. So he will try to make comparisons and he identify a lot of the elements of this group of documents. Actually, that will give, give us as well tools to identify elements in sculptures also. But with time, uh, the, the problem that that methodology that this German author create is that it was based in the observation of the of the planets and he was really deep into astronomy. That is good, it, it was very important. It's important to, to try to understand um, how they uh, approach, how the uh, Native Americans approach the idea of the planets and the movements of Venus and the moon, etc. But the problem with that original methodology is that everything that this uh, researcher could see, he, try to link with the with the planets and with the with the stars so that uh, gave us a little bit of problems because it didn't really was based on what the people believed uh, not everybody was based on the on the planets so in order to understand better uh, obviously more researchers uh, appear in scene and uh, one researcher that doesn't have to do with Mesoamerica was very important his name was Erwin Panofsky and he will, will create a methodology to study the renaissance so in order to understand the renaissance he uh, talks about different methods to approach that images so he will talk about the iconography 
and he will describe this as a study to identify, describe, and interpret the content of the images. So first of all, when we do uh, this analysis, you will have to take in consideration the form, the style, and the material. And then you could go to the second step that will be the iconography that will try to understand the topics, the themes, and the description of that images. In other words, what do, do the images mean? So, and then if it's possible, you could go further and um, prepare an iconology study. And in that study, you will try to understand the cultural meaning of that images. How, how was the cultural impact of that images? So that will be one of the bases to understand the images and that methodology that Erwin Panofsky created for the Renaissance will be adapted and will be approached by Mesoamerican uh, researchers in order to uh, be more scientific in the approach of the images. And then it was not an, uh, enough uh, and uh, that methodology because it, it was not made for Mesoamerica. So in order to create a better approach, we'll begin a new methodology that is called ethno-iconology. And this methodology, what, what, what we'll try to do is basically identify the minimal elements that appear in the image. Then we will need to check all the uh, written sources, particularly the sources that were created in the 16th century, in order that we could have more information and then we could have a thematic approach. But sometimes the Spanish uh, sources or, or the uh, Indian sources of that period doesn't give us all the information that we need. So in this approach, we will take into consideration the living um, the living Native Americans today and we will see the rituals their beliefs and they we will take that in, into consideration to approach the images that we want to understand from the past obviously it has risk and uh, because the time passed the symbols and signs change meaning but in order to avoid complications, we will try to use this method, particularly for the post-classic period. Going uh, backwards is more complex because there are so many centuries be you know, between us and, and them, then it will be difficult to use the, the same approach. But in this case, for this uh, course, uh, short course, uh, that is an introductory course in iconography, I will uh, use the example of some codices or books that were created in the post-classic period. And in that way, we could use elements of um, the Spanish sources of information from the 16th or 17th century, plus uh, studies that the uh, anthropology and ethnographic approach have given us in order to do that. So let's talk about a little bit about the images that I will uh, describe today. Uh, they are images that belong to the codices or codex. That what, what the world means, or, or in reality, what we are trying to, to say is that these uh, books are uh, describing what is the calendar, the ritual calendar or tonal powali, the count of the days. That's the reason they are called tonalamatl, or if we translate, it will be like the book of the days. So this um, material, basically will describe uh, the count of the days in different positions, but also it will uh, be related to divination, different kind of pronostics and rituals that they have to perform in, in, in order to have uh, a, a success, for, for instance, in agriculture, success in marriages or different things that they want to approach. Also, it's very good, uh, this material, because it give us like elements to understand more the religion and the mythology of these groups. Who create this codex? Well, 
this codex, uh, the examples that I will talk about, they are part or something called the Mixteca Puebla style. This style was widespread in uh, Mesoamerica during the post-classic period. And it seems that at that time, the elites or the, the people in power used to travel and exchange information quite a lot. So in order to, 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 to exchange information, they need a language or they need a style that make it available for everyone disregarding the language. So they really try to show this knowledge in order that everybody could un understood it. So it's an iconographic repertory that has uh, specific elements. And you could see, for instance, is, is poly, uh, polychrome. That means that it's full of color. It will be presented in different media. It could be in the codices. Also, it could appear in pottery. It could appear in mural painting, the different, different media. And the important thing is that it will be a stereotype. That means that the body will be uh, presented in the same ways. For instance, always profile. It's very, very strange that they present a, a person um, uh, not, not in profile. And also the head will be larger than the rest of the body because it's very important to show all the headdress and attire related to the head. And it, it has a line frame in black. And all the elements of the gods, all the, the clothing and that elements will, will be uh, easily identified in this style even though they are local uh, variations. It's not universal, but it's like a principle. Uh, to make an example of this, it's like we have, for example, the icons in our WhatsApp. No? So it doesn't matter the language that we speak, we can exchange this WhatsApp message and we could uh, understand based on the faces what we try to say. So it's a, it's a very simple example, but it's more or less how it worked. Obviously, the persons that will exchange these documents were persons from the lead and we, we will be person that has a, a knowledge of what they are uh, trying to say. They will know the religious elements, they will know the divinatory or romantic elements, so they will be able to make a reading of these documents. Now, in, a, in this iconographic um, um, documents, we will, uh, we will appear something that is very important, that is the gods. And the gods is something that uh, actually is very controversial in the study, because normally, uh, as, I, as I told you, the first person that really uh, tried to, to identify these gods was this German researcher, Edward Seller. But he try to approach them in a very western uh, westernized way so he wanted to see the gods and based on the spanish sources of information like an individual person an individual creature uh, that is unique he it has an, a, a unique identity nowadays we know that in mesoamerica is not so simple it's not like like uh, like that in reality i i want to to, to share with you this uh interesting um, uh, quote for, from a book of uh, Molly Bassett, that the idea of God of Teotl is not just like, in, in, like different identities, it's more complex because they exchange identities and what is a God is something that has a, pro a property or a, a possession. For instance, the Tlaloc, the God of the water, is the one that possesses the water and po uh, possesses the soil. But also it has a heat, has a day, has a fate, has a privilege and a fortune. He has an occupation, a business, and also it has it's something marvelous, it's something awesome, it's on, uh, something that is really worth it and is beloved and valuable. So that is a difference between the idea of a deity that is just like a like a person, like a, like a character, than uh, the idea of Teotl or God in the pre-Hispanic term that exchange uh, identities or exchange uh, particularly more than identities, exchange functions. So that's the reason we will see in iconography that a God that we will think, ah, well, it's, it's a God that is to totally different to another. Well, in reality has a lot of things in common and they have a lot of things that they uh, uh, share. So 
one example that I will talk in my in, in this um, in this uh, meeting is about the feather serpent because the feather serpent is one of the most important gods or deities or teotl in terms of Nahuatl in Mesoamerica. So we know um, we how we can identify this uh, this god. Well. First of all, um, we see here, here is our uh, our character that is Quetzalcoatl. As you can see, he is, um, we can identify by the headdresses and particularly what it will be the shell that is in his chest. Also, normally he performs um, uh, self-sacrifice and bloodletting exercise in this case he is uh, bloodletting his uh, penis and he will have a different kind of um, facial painting in this case we can see the line that is crossing his eye that is one of uh, of, of many that will appear uh, the quetzalcoatl feathers and also we see uh, that his body is black. And the reason that his body is black is because he is a priest or he's related to priesthood. Therefore, uh, this is the, 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 the painting, the corporal painting that the priest will have. So coming back to who is him, we will see that uh, in the Maya region is known as Kukulkan or in the mystic uh, culture is known as Nine Winds. Uh, Nine Wind is his calendar name and also uh, appears in codex um, uh, from Central region. but normally he doesn't, he appears like a Hecatl or the, or the wind, not with the name Nine Wind, that, that is more mystic. His personality could change. He could be sometimes the wind, sometimes he's Venus, or sometimes he's a monster called Xolotl that represents the twins, or is like an, an animal form that the god could have, a monstrous dog. So here we have another uh, way to identify him. As you can see, we have we is sitting in a front. Is his his corporal painting is black. He has the important large uh, seashell to identify him. He has um, element that is a core cotton earplug that normally uh, he will wear. And the, in this case, you can see his painting is different. His uh, facial painting is different, is uh, tricolor, and is not like lines. So he could appear with one or another one. As well, he appears with the Quetzal feathers and these particular feathers with eyes of the night that is uh, related to him. And uh, here he appears with a headdress of a snake and a bone that is for self-sacrifice. So that is more or less uh, the characteristic of his um, identity. Obviously, depending on what he's doing or the titles that he will uh, show in the image, that elements will change. And that's the difficulty of approaching this, um, this codex. As I told you, he as well is related to uh, another form. He has another form that is Xolotl or the monstrous dog, or um, is, his, is his double. And as you can see here, we see the shell that it shares. We see as well these feathers with the uh, stars or with the nocturnal eyes, and we see the cotton earplug. So, but it changed the face. As you can see, here is a dog, or is this animal that is like a dog with an open mouth. And here we can see as well in a sculpture. And obviously, basic, basically, we can identify it easily based on the earplug. So that's very important to know how are the how can we identify the distinctive elements. So these um, gods will have so many elements, but by identifying the more the more important ones, it will be easier for us to do this um, this approach and be able to identify them better. Also. He appeared here related to a monkey, and you will say, well, what is the relationship? I, here is difficult. Well, he has something that is called the mouth uh, mask of a do dog's bed. And this one is related to his identity as the winds. He, uh, here appears as a snake. 
and he is a monkey, no, a pregnant monkey, according to some specialists, as you can see in the Tommy. And also here we have another um, another identity, another representation, and he has as well the mouth mask that is related to the winds. So we know that other of the names of the of the gods is um, a hecatl, and here we have it. Uh, what we have in common, what, what you could identify again, we have the shell, we have the cork, uh, cotton earplug, we have the mouth mask, and here it has an element that is from the Waztec region, that is a cone shaped hat, an element of the nocturnal sun, and uh, also has a, a fake bird. And so you can see the elements change. But it has distinctive, uh, distinctive iconography and iconographical elements that uh, still uh, appear, and in this occasion appears also with a uh, tobacco bag. That means that he is related to priesthood, and the instruments of self sacrifice that is um, the bone and the spine. So that that in that way we can see that is uh, having a lot of elements that are quite similar. No. Now, what we could know about this um, this god, what uh, is the realms of Quetzalcoatl, Hecatl, Xolotl, no? So we know uh, here that Quetzalcoatl has different names. Uh, it's called as well Nanahuatzin, and is related to the sacrifice uh, in the in the first uh, period of existence of the world and the gods, and he is uh, related to the creation of the sun. And also Quetzalcoatl uh, is related to the rulers. So it was very important. It was a title also that a lot of the rulers in that period in particular used to have. So if they want to legitimize their power, they used to take uh, some rituals. They have to perform some rituals and they used to uh, have to per uh, identify themselves, assume their identity with Quetzalcoatl. In the case of when he's a Hecatl or where he is the wind, he is related to the creation of the human beings and also is related to the creation of the Magay. And it's, it's, a, it's a journey that he has to do to in order to achieve that, to, to, to create the humans. And as a Xolotl or the twin, the monstrous dog, he has to, he has a lot of importance because he is related to the sacrifice by extraction of the heart and is as well related to the creation of the humans because he goes with Quetzalcoatl, go with, it's like a double identity that has to go to the underworld to recover the bonds of the previous humans in order to create the new humans that will inhabit Earth during the fifth sun. And also, he is related to Venus. To, uh, and as you can see, it's a lot of identities that he has, a lot of titles. And in, in this identity related to Tlahuizcalpantecutli, that is quite a long name, no? Tlahuizcalpantecutli, that is Venus. Uh, he is uh, related to the war and he is related to the cremation of the bodies also because is this identity is related to a historical character called Seacatl Topitzil Quetzalcoatl or one read Quetzalcoatl that was the mythical uh, king of Tolan or Tula and he you know there are different versions of what happened to him but one is that he has to go and he has to uh, sacrifice himself and then he become a uh, Venus. So here we have uh, some images to explain more that myth. And I would like to show you just this uh, brief um, video. Here, as you can see in this sculpture, you can identify now a part of the snake that he is inside of the snake. You can identify also now the, ear, the cotton earplugs that he has. And we know based on different myths, particularly in the Leyenda de los Soles, that he has to go to the underworld and he has to face um, Mictlantecutli, the god of death, in order to uh, have the bones of the previous humans. But obviously Mictlantecutli didn't like it and he tricked him and he uh, will do everything to avoid that he take the bones. That's the reason they are related both to death and life together uh, because at the end Quetzalcoatl will succeed. We, we, he will steal the bones 
from the Lord of the Dead, and then he will have to bleed his penis in order to uh, provide uh, uh, this element that will create the life from the from the bones that will be uh, uh, all put together by a goddess Kilasli. Also, he will follow uh, ants and he will be in charge to talk to the Tlaloque, the lords of the mountains, and he will find the way to steal or to take the corn from a place called Tona, Tonacatepetl or the mountain of the sustenance or maintenance. And then in that way, he will be able to provide the corn to the new humans from the fifth son. And also, as uh, another of his attributes will be the creation of the plants uh, based in a in a myth in the Codex Maglavichano. As you can see here, I'm going to stop it. You can recognize he is a Hecatl. He has the face mask and also has the shell. So you and also has the earplug. Now you can begin to identify him. He well, according to this Codex, he will uh, be related to this. Um, to the creation of the of the flowers because he will touch himself and his semen will create will go to a rock and from that uh, from that semen it will be born a bat and that bat will go um, and attack a goddess called Sochiketsa, the goddess of the flowers of the precious flowers uh, she the bat will um, horrible uh, history, uh, history because he will bite the goddess uh, private parts and then the flowers will be born the flowers originally will smell very bad and so they have to take the the flowers to the underworld to be washed again we have this uh, relationship between Quetzalcoatl and the god of the dead Niklantec Woodley working together or fighting or working together and then these flowers will be washed and the nice uh, flowers the ones that smell delicious will be uh, born so he is related also with the creation of the plants and as i explained you previously here we can see it as Xolotl. he he appears with his animal form with his um, a characteristic cotton earplug, his shell, and also you can see appears with the sun uh, four movement, appears the symbol movement, appears the symbol of the number four, and this is rela related to the creation or obviously of the sun. The name of the fifth sun is for movement, and also we can see him as a sacrificer because he has to sacrifice the previous beings to have their hearts and be able to uh, create the new life. And here he appears related again to the sign of the day called movement. He appears in a different form. Here is a different characteristic, a different iconography. Um, in that uh, image that I, I, I just showed previously, I will uh, stop there. Um, he appears with his mouth uh, open and appears like death, his, uh, his eye is out and his body is all deformed because as well, Xolotl means like deformity. So he appears uh, with the, not in an animal form, so in a human form. And he has this hand that is a characteristic element uh, that related to the gods called Maquiltonale, that are gods that are related to change, to they appear in moments of uh, cataclysms or when something will be created. So that's the reason as well he appears with that uh, identity. And also, as I told you before, he is related to Venus, to Venus, uh, uh, when he is related to Venus, uh, is because he sacrificed himself into the fire, he jumped into the fire, and then the planet, uh, well, not uh, the planet Venus was created for in, in Agua, uh, for the Nahuas, it was a star, it was co called the Down Star. And when he comes back to Earth as, a, as the star, as Venus, uh, the birds were created, uh, the birds were born, and also. Uh, it will appear as a warrior. So as you can see, he changed completely here, uh, his uh, identity. He doesn't appear as we see with the same elements, but we can recognize him because he has his face like a school and he has a circle. These circles in his face represent the cardinal points 
no, the, the, what really are is five circles, but in this image you cannot see five because it's profile. So he is related to to the cardinal points and appears in their in their face all the five directions. Let me show you the next images. He is attacking. He's attacking. It's a bad pronostic. And here you can see better when he appears like Venus appears with this uh, facial painting. We have appeared uh, here four uh, four points, but in reality is another one on, on, on his other cheek. But we can see him in profile, so that's the reason we cannot see the the distinctive element. But disregarding the other elements that he could have that are associated to other gods, that for instance, this one that I will explain uh, in a moment, what we can see is that is Venus, Quetzalcoatl, Venus or Tlahuiscalpante, basic, basically because we can identify his um, facial painting, and we know that it's related to his uh, identity as a star, related to the five directions of the five cardinal points. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Now I would like to explain you about uh, Tezcatlipoca, that is one of the most important uh, gods in or Teotl in this um, Mesoamerica, uh, uh, Mesoamerica in the post-classic period. Uh, Tezcatlipoca means a uh, smoking mirror, and he will be associated with obsidian mirrors, divination, end of an era, discord, war, night, and rulership. So he has so many identities. He's, he's always uh, a, a god that is exchanging uh, characteristics and properties. One of his titles is Yowali Hecatl, that is the Black Wind, that is, uh, is an identity that he shares with Quetzalcoatl as well, or, or uh, and Quetzalcoatl Hecatl. He has many names related to what he does. He is the king of the mockery. So he uh, is, uh, his titles will be related to that. Uh, some of his titles appear to be related to war also. He is the enemy of both sides. He is the one that we are his slaves and he does whatever he wants no, as well. He's part of his uh, uh, characteristics. He's a trickster and is associated with particular animals like jaguar, the skunk, the turkey, the coyote, and the owl, and normally is related to the calendar sign read, and particularly he has a name that is the two read. No? So how we identify this god that is so important, but we can see, but more importantly, the mirror. So we know that his name is the smoking mirror, so the mirror is here and he represents the small. He has lost a leg, and instead of the of the of the of the oh, sorry uh, not a leg a foot, he lost a foot, and in the foot we have the mirror as well with the smoke. We have this element that's very important pectoral called anahuatl that is very characteristic of him. And also another way to recognize him easily is the facial painting that is the black stripes across his face. Uh, norm, as well, he has the part of his body in black and other elements that he has equal exchange with other gods. Also, he normally appears as warrior uh, and he is related because of that to arrows, the shield and war flag. He is the war flag, the shield and the arrows. We have here a very uh, important um, a work of art that is his representation that is in the British Museum as a well it's a school as you can see we have the black stripes crossing his face and that's the reason we could uh, identify as well that is related to Tezcatlipoca because of a uh, painting also he's related he has many identities is related to the Huehue Coyotl or the old coyote and is related to music is related related to sexual uh, pleasures uh, sexual intercourse uh, forbidden activities and he mocks he constantly is mocking everyone and here as you can see now you can uh, find this paint this 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 uh, facial painting this shell and this earplug of cotton is related to Quetzalcoatl. Now you can see it uh, 
easily. And as well, we have here the, the feathers that are in his headdress. And we have here a creature that has exactly the chest pastoral anahuatl of Tezcatlipoca is a jaguar, as you can see, it's a jaguar, and also has here the mirror with the smoke. Therefore, he has a lot of elements of him and his name is Tepeyolotl or the heart of the mountain. So there is another identity that he has that he ha is the heart of the mountain. And this is because he is as well a jaguar. So where does the jaguar live? Obviously in the mountain. So he is in charge of protecting the mountain. It's, it's related to the spirits or the essence that live in that mountain. And that's the reason he could have that uh, elements. And also he's related to the Turkey. Uh, here we have it as a, is a person or an Ishipla, a representative of this uh, god. And here we have the smoking mirror as well. And we have here the same pectoral. So we know that this bird is related to the gods. And if you are more interested in this um, Tezcatlipoca, I recommend you these two interesting books that could be very useful for getting deeper into it. Now we have uh, this smoking mirror, as we can see. Uh, we have uh, all the elements. He appears also sometimes uh, with the calendar and size in his body. In this case, we can see more than anything his mirror. We can see the obsidian that he is related to because the mirrors were used for divination. They could tell you your destiny. They could tell you what will happen to you. So the mirrors were a very important element of that. And the smoke as well is like a metaphor that is, through the smoking mirror he can see everything. You cannot, uh, you can never cheat on him in the sense that he will know everything. Actually, the there, there was a practice, a ritual that, that just once in, a, in, in life, they have to confess uh, all their sins, all their fails to a priest, and that priest is the priest of Tezcatlipoca, and then he will uh, give you a penitence and you could be forgiven. It's related to the jaguar and also is the nocturnal sky, so it's very related to the night and the things that happen during the night. Also, to, uh, to show you some uh, other example, we have a god that is very easy to identify, that is Tlaloc, that is the god of the rain, lightning, and the mountains, is also the earth, the soil, and he is a container of rain and seeds, produce clouds, his calendar sign is the deer, he reigns a place called Tlalocan, that is the afterlife uh, where people, the life of lightning or diseases related to water goes, and his color is the blue. And obviously all his characteristics, all his iconography will be related to water as we could see here. And we could identify now, he is Tlaloc. One of the elements that you can distinguish always his, he, him is his fangs, he has the fangs and he has like a Google Google eye. So that's the way we can immediately identify him. He will be related to the water. Uh, in the, normally he appears in color blue. And also uh, here we have a priest that is related to, to, the, to the God, no? And as well, it has the same elements and has a, a headdress uh, that shows elements of paper that is related to the gods of the water and also the rain. So they have that two characteristics. Uh, and we can see it easily here in um, a vessel in the, the, that was found in Templo Mayor. We can see immediately the Googles and we can see the fangs to identify him easily. And also he will be related to the corn, obviously, because he's a provider of the fertility to allow everything to grow. And another important uh, god that we will see is Tlaltecutli, the earth, and it will be associated uh, with, um, obviously, the creation of everything is like the mother and father of everything. It uh, uh, has a, a difficult identification in their sexuality because in reality, what we can see is that it's female and male. And a way to identify it when appears like a person, like in a human form, is the ways that the arms and the legs are displayed. He has, all, or he or she has always an open mouth and has clothes and the curly hair that the 
deities of the underworld have. And also is related to the mythical cocodrile or is part, uh, it was formed from this mythical cocodrile that, or caiman that used to be at the beginning of the world. Here we have the, the um, this uh, interesting uh, stone sculpture uh, found in Templo Mayor, as you can see, how it's in a position of childbirth and it's a, a position of creation that she is, uh, appears with the curly hair of the deities of the underworld and also appears like with a, like, um, the characteristic face of the deities of the underworld because it's obviously related to the underworld and is drinking the blood no so appears uh, and has clothes and it has a school so it's related to the death and also to the creation because that's the reason appears in that position so what we know uh, in order to identify it we have the sources and in iconography we know that we have to take into consideration what we know thanks to the written sources so basic, basically we know that the atlantic woodley uh, was a creature or uh, created by or was a caiman like a monster it was a monster that was out of control it was always a uh, uh, hungry and always ca causing problems. So Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca decide to become uh, two snakes and come back to Earth in order to put him in control. So they will trap her, the, go the goddess and the goddess Tlaltecutli, and then they will be able to lift and separate the air from the sky, but they will break her body. So by breaking her body, obviously the goddess will need a repayment because she suffered so much when she was caught by these gods that become snakes. And as a reason, she will appear with her mouth open ready for offerings because she sacrificed her body. So she appears in a position of childbirth or giving birth because uh, she provides everything, all the plants and everything uh, born from, from her, but she will need to be fed. And that's the reason her mouth is opening, is open, sorry, and appears also um, uh, sometimes a flint. And here you can see it's a body and it's the mouth, it's like the mouth and uh, a body was inside that mouth. So it needs to eat the persons. So that is about the gods. Now I will, uh, I know my time is quite short, so I just want to show you as well that in this, uh, to, in order to understand iconography, we need to understand more what the thing says. So we just cannot just read an image and, and take it literally. We need to understand how the actions are portrayed. And normally the actions are portrayed or indicated by corporal positions or visual metaphors. So what does I mean with that? So for instance, we have here a um, way to express uh, the concept of catching a prisoner of war. So the, the, the way that in the in, in, the, in Mesoamerica in general, the way that they uh, show that they have catch a prisoner of war or they have captured someone is by grabbing the person by the hair. So here we could read uh, easily, uh, we just know that, that she, this woman catch a prisoner of war. But knowing more about the elements of the, of the iconography, knowing more about the sources of information, we can identify that this woman is a goddess called Tlazolteotl, the goddess of the filth, is uh, one of the translations that uh, it has, or the goddess of love, the goddess of cotton, and, the, and she is related to the, a woman that died in childbirth. So in reality, what he we can see that she caught a prisoner. Yes, she caught a prisoner, but in the sense that she caught a baby. So she is related to this idea that, uh, that a woman that, that died in uh, during the child childbirth caught the prisoner that was this baby and will go to this particular uh, afterlife uh, that is uh, going with the son and be with him during the the time that he goes under under the under earth no when is the, the the night and also here we have again as as you could identify now a jaguar and this jaguar is related to weapons and is in a mountain so this jaguar 
it doesn't have other element apart from the mountain. So normally we could think, well, it's a Yosa Jaguar, but because we know it's in the mountain and we know the elements or, or that is related to some calendrical days, we can identify that this, this aspect of the Scatlipoca, the smoking mirror, that is the heart of the mountain. So that is like the importance of having a written sources that could help us to do a proper identification. So here we have another convention that is uh, two uh, persons facing each other, two women, uh, sorry, a woman and a man, a woman and a man facing each other and giving presents is a convention that normally is related to the marriage. So to represent marriage normally is this convention of a couple no, facing each other, exchanging uh, Gibbs and sometimes in some codex, mixed codex, they are linked together. In this case, they are just facing each other. But we know because the, the nature of our codices or our document, we know that in reality is a, a, a pronostic or is a way that a person will read the lock of, of, the, of the people that are thinking about getting married. So based on symbols and signs, like particularly the signs of the day, they could think, well, this marriage will be successful or not. So here we have the lady with an offering, and here we have the man also offering uh, something, and it will be based uh, on the signs of the day, the, the lock that they will have. Here we have another pronostic of marriage. I don't think, that as you can see, this one is not very good, not very successful. We have here, the couple, but he is caught by the hair. So she made him like, a, he catch him like a captive of war, but he has a position that is not natural. Normally in this in this codex, the convention is that when the position is not natural means that something, something naughty is going on or is something related to uh, things that are not appropriate, behavior that is not appropriate. And as you can see, well, obviously the behavior is not very appropriate because he has here a lady and he's touching, touching her. And uh, obviously, well, we can see that this marriage maybe won't be very successful. And he has also here a snake that is long to really uh, make a point that he is uh, quite naughty, you know, to say so in a, in a way. So this is the convention of um, making a captive that we will see in this case is a woman catching her own husband no? or her own partner. And also as well, we have some elements to, uh, for instance, sexual intercourse that is a couple that is covering a blanket and an element a sign of fire that is related to this um, scene. We have very few uh, scenes of that. And we have also other, other images that are related more than sex, more, it's more like with the creative, with the creation, with the um, uh, fecundity, that these, uh, these uh, two persons sharing um, an, a knife uh, that is a flint, no? And the idea is because the flint is considered a creative, a creative element. It creates fire and is related to meats where the a, a, a knife fell down and from the sky and creates um, everything, all the gods. And also we have to be careful because they are uh, visual metaphors that we cannot read. Uh, just like, uh, like we have to be careful and understand a little bit more. For instance, here we have, as you can see, a jaguar and um, an eagle. The eagle and the jaguar, we know, it's not just the animals, what is trying to express this image is the military orders. So we can see here that is what, what it's trying to tell us is really like the war or the warriors. But also they have these uh, flags and these flags means that they have been capturing war and they have these feathers. These spe specific feathers are related to the persons that were capturing war. So they are not just representing uh, the animals, they are represented the, the military orders and they are representing the concept of the war. We have here the god, um, the, the god of the sun, that is uh, Tonatiu. And Tonatiu has uh, the, his name is the four movements. And he will appear here with, again, these flags. And these flags are related to the, to the capture of the sacrifice uh, of, um, 
of an enemy. And also is related to this concept that is called atlachinoli, that means the water and the burns, and that means that is the war. So it's, um, it's a, a way to tell you that is war and war where the sun is related to. So these elements are not just like uh, water, like, like that. It's, it's this concept, metaphoric concept. The same when we see weaponry, the weaponry, when they display uh, the shield and the arrows, obviously is related to war, but also in these uh, images, they can include other elements, for example, the flag that we can see here, or they will include another weapon to reiterate, to make you clear that what they are trying to express is war. And here we see a, a person that I explained you, not with a, a, a position of the body uh, natural, is like falling. So that means that he will be catch or he will be suffer the consequence of the war based on the corporal position. And also here in the metaphoric way to express concepts also, we have here the concept of the captive of war uh, to represent the, cap the, the captive of a war. They will uh, represent a metaphor, a visual, a visually, that is the chalk and the feathers. So here, the color that we ha he has in his body is white with uh, the stripes uh, all across the body and as well the feather. And also he has a rope, you know, to make it more, um, more obvious that he has been as uh, or he will be sacrificed the nudity also is associated with sacrifice so you can see it's a lot of elements to give us uh concepts and we have here um an, a, another uh persons another uh, gods um coming to earth she has a, here again this idea of atla chinoli or war this concept of this water with something born. And also he has elements of a stone that is, as you can see, with an eye and a mouth, is considered a living thing. And also he has sticks and he has an ax. That means that he will give to, uh, to the person's punishment. So this is uh, some examples that you have to take in consideration when you approach uh, the iconography that you have to get into the, the meaning of the elements, how they put them together and how they will express that idea as other concepts. So taking in account that I would like to know if you feel prepared to make some identifications or try to, to achieve uh, see who is the god that is represented or who is the, the character that is represented, not necessarily a god. For instance, we can begin with this one. Uh, I don't know if someone would like to, to see what do you think uh, it represents, uh, what do you consider, which elements do we have to make an uh, 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 a quick uh, and uh, quite uh, uh, brief uh, identification of the icon. You can you can uh, turn off your uh, turn on sorry your microphone and, and and see and participate if you wish. Someone could say which animal which animal we can see here. Is it a jaguar? Uh-huh. Carrying a flag? Yeah. So if it's a jaguar carrying a flag, what do you think it will represent? A prisoner? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a prisoner. And the jaguar is related, obviously, to this. Uh, it's a warrior. So it's, it's a prisoner of war. And here we have the, the weapons. So yeah, very well, well done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who would like to try to get into this one? I know it looks difficult, but it doesn't matter. You have to to try. Don't fear. Um, don't fear it. Let's try it. So, who could uh, guess what we are seeing here? Check the shell. The painting. Who do you think is this this uh, character, or which kind of relationship with which 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 god will be related to this character? We know he has a, a bag, a copal bag. Oh, I see. Angelica, can you please allow people to unmute? Ah, yes, of course. I see. Well, it's not, not, no. But the, the other Angelica, I think. Ah, okay. Uh, 
because people cannot unmute. Can you try again, Penny, please? No. No, it's not it's not possible. Okay. Let me let me try another way. Still muted. Okay. Okay. Um what we can do. Well, maybe we can um we can see through the chat. Uh-huh. So who who would like to identify uh, this one? This one is a very difficult one, actually, and, and, and it's, it's very interesting because maybe you will see the, the elements that are there. It's, um, it's quite complex, and I, I'm sure that you will be able to, to find out. So I don't know if we can see, yeah, someone say a Hecatl, yeah. Yeah, we see a Hecatl here based on that, but and we can see the shell. The, the the painting, but what do we have here? Can you see what he has here? What he has here? I don't know. If you can see in this part that I I don't know. If you can know that I uh, see my 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 uh, image. He has two mirrors. Can you see? One in his leg. He doesn't have a foot, and he has a mirror, and he has another mirror. So. What does he, does he tell us? A smoking mirror, exactly. So what we have here is a combination of Quetzalcoatl, the feather serpent, with the smoking mirror, Tezcatlipoca. Uh, so we have this concept of Jowali Hecatl, this idea of the wind of the night that I explained before. So as you can see, two gods are mixing each other. So they share completely the elements. And here we can see also uh, Quetzalcoatl, as you have identified properly um, in the comments. Here, uh, yes, sorry, Angelica, people are able to ask questions or to, to answer your questions directly. Now they should be able to unmute, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this one, uh, who would like to identify this uh, character? How we could do it easily in order that we don't we don't get lost in the image? Try to look at his face. Mm -hmm. What we can see in his face? The blue water. Uh huh. Exactly. We have the is Tlaloc. Exactly. Perfect. And here we have this image is related to um, Codex Cospi and his offerings that are related to Tlaloc. And we know that there are offerings. These numbers that will appear here are related to offerings that will be given to Tlaloc in order that he can provide uh, uh, everything that he does, no? So mm -hmm. we know that because and now, thanks to the ethnographical studies, we know that it's, uh, it's a way that, it's a, it's a kind of rituals that are still performing uh, in Native Americans. They are still carrying on with these rituals. And this one, that will be the last one. We have seen, obviously, the sun you can, uh, we, I show you the sun, but where we can see Tlaltecutli or the God of Earth. Can you find it? Someone can find it. What is doing the, the Tlaltecutli, the Earth? And where is it? I will help a little bit. Here you can see is the monster, but he has the the, the, the fangs open and he is, is hitting is hitting the head of a bird and this is the blood so here is the monster of the earth we see it in different forms but also appears in this with this identity when we see these fangs and this this uh, monster eating something we know that is the Tlaltecutli or the god of the earth and we see also an animal that is very difficult to identify that is defecating. This animal has been um, identified in different ways by the specialist. Some, think, some of them think this is a monkey, some of them think this is a skunk. I think it's very difficult really to, to know exactly. But what we can know is that he is giving the blood to the sun to feed the sun that we know that is related to the war. We know the name of the sun that is for movement, we, know, we see that this god is related completely to the war. And we know that this um, 
animal that has been given has a sacrificial flag. So has been sacrificed or is sacrificed. And here we have the moon with the rabbits that we know in basically thanks to the myths that the moon has a rabbit because the gods draw it to it. And we have the one reed, the year one reed, that and as I explained, the, one, the year one read is the year that uh, Quetzalcoatl, Seacatl, Topilsin die and become Venus. So in reality, we have the sun, the moon, the, the night sky, and Venus, and everything is related to a sacrifice of plus. And well, that is all my presentation. And thank you very much. And I would love to to know if you have some questions. Thank you very much, Angelica. This is this is truly fascinating, but it's so mysterious uh, to many of us. No, so many elements, tiny little elements that are crowded in a small space, so it appears really difficult. But little by little, you have helped us to detect one feature here, another feature there, and uh, yeah, I kept thinking, um, well, many things. One is the way in which this type of, of drawing has been preserved in contemporary cartoons, no? Um, because there, there is a connection between uh, the, the Mexican cartoon tradition and, and like satirical things and, and some of these elements. But also the fact that we usually uh, cannot are very illiterate and we cannot understand the meaning of, of all of these little details. And um, yes, I would like to, to open the, the floor to everybody. You can, you should be able to unmute right now. So you can ask questions or make comments either through the chat or um, live with your own voice. There are many congratulations, Angelica. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I just want, this is just an invitation uh, to the iconography. You can find these fascinating codices online in the FAMSI, F-A-M-S-I website. They have all the codex there in order that you can enjoy and you can explore and you can see. I wanted to show you that this uh, iconographic approach is, is difficult in the sense that to, in order to understand, we have to as well take into consideration the written sources of information. So we compare different images and uh, we, we, we compare in different kind of, um, uh, it could be in codices, could be in sculptures, could be mural painting, pottery, etc. But we need to uh, understand a little bit more the meanings. And thankfully, we have sources of information for this period that is the post classic. And also, we have ethnographic information. So it is the way that we can construct our knowledge of these elements. It's complex, it's difficult in this, but uh, I'm sure that uh, you could, uh, it's an invitation and you could um, try to approach it. I recommend you particularly a very nice book that is uh, written by Elizabeth Hill Boone, that is Cycles of Time and Meaning in the Mesoamerican Books of Fate. It's also available in Spanish, and that book will provide you like the like uh, like a great tool. It's a great tool uh, to work the, begin to work it, and from that point you will be able to see uh, different iconographic uh, patterns in different kind of supports. You know? And um, I'm sure the, the answer is not a simple one, but what were these images used for? For example, were they used to, to transmit some ideas from one generation to another, or were they used to for traveling and for setting up rituals in a different place, or were they, were they kept together with other codices? Is, is that known at all? 
Uh, yeah, well, they, this this in particular, the one that I show you is called uh, the 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 books of the fate or the destiny or the books of the divinator for, for divination. So in reality, will be a book that will be kept by an specialist, and you will um, you will use uh, this specialist during the rest of your life. So is that where equivalent of, for for instance, a psychologist or or um, you believe in, uh, for example, in tarot, no? Or, or something, it's, it's a divinatory art. So you need uh, support to know what we will do in your marriage. Uh, you have a baby, the baby, you have to see when the baby was born, which day of the sacred calendar was born, and then you will see the look that it could have, but the look will change. So you need a specialist to let you know, well, maybe the baby will have good luck, but you will need to perform these rituals. Also what's used for, uh, uh, to know when you have to do the harvest, when it's time of sowing, which uh, all kind of divination. So it, will, it was basically to know the future. So that was the idea and it was very important to them. It was basically uh, the, the source of knowledge that will uh, guide them through the life. And um, is it known what kind of instrument they use? Did they use quills like from birds or what sharp instruments they use for drawing? And where did they get the pigments for the colors? Yeah. The, the the this particular codex well uh, they are um, they have uh, both natural and mineral pigments and uh, they will need to, the what, what, the way to do it is that there are different um, materials but this divinatory codex in particular are made from a uh, skin and it's particularly uh, deer skin according to some specialists there are still um, studies that have to be made in this codex but they are quite intrusive so some some of the codex have studies of the of the materiality but not all of them but what they have uh, seen is that they have this uh, skin of animal that is fold together is like uh, they make like a big a long um like, like the codex is, is long and they put uh, the skin together and then they fold it and they they will use like a stucco uh, or some kind of white uh, chalk to um to put the pigments and uh, the pigments can stay there and they will use different 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 kind of uh, materials but particularly in uh, in these codices that are from the mixteca puebla they will use more uh, organic material more than uh, mineral because they have more color so from different plants and yeah you you would like to there are uh, some studies of uh, these uh, materials i recommend you to to read the works of elude dupe that is uh, and uh, david dominici that they are uh, working in the materials of the codice cospi particularly mm -hmm. there is a question from uh -huh. I have been hearing that some sources from Mesoamerica are being scanned and indexed with uh, AI, mm -hmm. though I think it is later Spanish and Portuguese records. Haven't heard if they are actually taking in any of the remaining native civilization sources. Got a webinar in the group tied into Lancaster University in the UK. Now yeah, that's that's very interesting to know. Uh, to be honest, I suppose that nowadays uh, with all the uh, digital humanities, there are a lot of projects to 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 to, to, to approach these codices. There are a lot of efforts to um, to really preserve them and to make the uh, uh, make, make them available to the general public. There are projects. Uh, uh, recently, there is a study of the uh, Codice Vatican B or Vaticano B. Uh, that has been as well uh, published uh, by Katarzyna Mikulska and a team. The, there is a, the University of Bologna. And now the, I can see that the colleagues in England, the ones that are more taken into consideration for the codices, like the Native American uh, approach, the persons that are still into the, the do performing rituals that are similar are particularly the researchers of Leiden University. They are still doing that work, no? Yeah, and uh, it may, I add that on the 
Wednesday, is it the 18th or the 19th of August, we are going to have a talk by Professor Patricia Murrieta from Lancaster University. Mm. Uh, it's Wednesday, the 18th of, of August, um, about a project in digital humanities. So you're all invited to that yes, not okay. in due course. And yeah. then there is another question, Angelica. Thank you for your excellent conference. What is your interpretation in relation to the central circle of the Aztec calendar, according to the face of, of the Tlatechtli, uh -huh. because of its characteristics uh, of the claws and the face and tongue? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. It's very interesting and, and as you know, very polemic indeed. Uh, I know that Doris Hayden has identified it like uh, Tlaltecutli, and some researchers have been discussing that. But I particularly think that it's Tonatiu, and the reason of that I don't think it's Tlaltecutli, um, the, the, the earth, is because it has, if you see um, closely to the uh, image of the sunstone, it has... Um, uh, some lines around the eyes and that lines that he has are as well um, represented in, in Tonatiu as uh, when in the codex. So in the codex appears sometimes in his body completely yellow and uh, place that line in red like appears in the uh, sunstone. So I believe more than it's like the sun itself, like more, more than Tlaltecutli, the earth. But anyway, it could be like, um, at the end of the day, there is a, um, in this uh, metaphoric language that they have, sometimes they used to talk to talk about the, like the, the complexity of the world. They used to have a uh, different or a, uh, these metaphoric uh, ideas of the earth, the sun, to say that everything. So it could have both elements, but in particular, I think that is more related to the sun, but I don't um, deny that it's, it's quite similar as well to the earth or to the Kutli because the, the knife that has in the mouth also. Excellent. Very well. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, if, if not, um, then uh, it only remains to say goodbye for now. If you can stop sharing, Angelica, so, so we can all we'll be there. Yes, thank, thank you. And um, next Wednesday, that is this Wednesday, we have the final talk of, of the Tlaloc series to which you're all invited in the first module, and we will come back in, in the month of September. But throughout August, we shall have different talks related to uh, the 500th anniversary of the fall of Tenochtitlan. And then is when is the next talk uh, of yours, Angelica? Is it the last? Um, I think it's at the beginning of August. I'm not sure to be honest. Okay, we to need check to my check calendar. Let you know. We'll let you know because it's a series of five talks by Angelica, by Dr. Angelica Baena, and um, they, they will be um, followed by the, the second module of the Tlaloc series, okay? Um, very nice to see you. We are um, looking forward to seeing you again, and we are glad you, you're enjoying these talks. Um, thank you, and see you very soon. Goodbye very much. to everybody, and if Angelica and... Uh, the presenters, Javier, if you can stay.